worship at Westminster and to our inclusive family of faith. We especially welcome any visitors that are joining us this morning and those also that are joining us on YouTube. The gospel reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 2, and I'll be starting at verse 21. Listen for the word of God. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what was stated in the law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. When they had had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The Gospel of the Lord. There are actually three separate events occurring at two separate times and probably two locations in this story. We tend to run them all together into one. In verse 21, eight days after his birth, Jesus is circumcised. And scripture doesn't actually say where this took place or who provided the service. The local rabbi generally handled this duty. It was also customary to officially name the child at that time. The rest of the story takes place at the temple in Jerusalem 40 days after Jesus' birth. One event was the ceremony of purification, and the third event, being the firstborn son, Jesus was to be either dedicated to the Lord at this time, much like Hannah dedicated her son Samuel to the Lord, or redeemed, as Jack said, of this duty by paying the sum of five shekels. This custom was required because in Egypt, God had spared the firstborn of the Jews. Therefore, the firstborn belonged to God. Since no money changed hands in this story, Jesus was dedicated to the Lord, not redeemed. The ceremony of purification was really for Mary, not Jesus. According to the law, a woman was considered unclean for seven days after the birth of a son and not permitted to enter the sanctuary for an additional 33 days. Her sentence was twice that long after the birth of a daughter. Seems to me that boys are inherently dirtier than girls, but then what do I know? In Leviticus, the law calls for a lamb to be sacrificed at this ceremony, but it goes on to say that if the woman cannot afford a lamb, two turtle doves or pigeons are okay. I think it's interesting that for whatever reason, most likely Joseph and Mary couldn't afford a lamb, that a lamb was not sacrificed for the mother of the Lamb of God. In one sense, these scenes, these are rather mundane scenes. There are no angels singing or crying out, do not be afraid. Angels must really be scary. The first thing they always say to humans is, do not be afraid. 
There were no guiding stars or visitations from shepherds or wise men. Actually, Mary and Joseph were kind of settling back into somewhat of a normal life after the major disruption of traveling to Bethlehem, having a baby, and being visited by a bunch of smelly sheep herders telling crazy stories. Yet these few verses give us a glimpse into the depth of Mary and Joseph's faith. They were deeply involved in the religious life and rituals and traditions of their Jewish faith. They brought Jesus up in the context of the temple and synagogues, worship, sacrifice, prayer, study, discussion, and fellowship were all part of Jesus' life. These factors would all shape him and mold him and mold his relationship with his heavenly father. Now, Simeon is described as a man living in Jerusalem at the time. He's not identified as a priest or having any official capacity in the temple, though he might have been. He's described as a righteous and devout man, a holy and committed man, looking forward to Israel's consolation. Luke doesn't actually say that he was old, though he probably was. He was likely a scholar of the scriptures, especially the messianic prophecies. And God had granted him the Holy Spirit, which at that time was reserved only for prophets. So it stands to reason that Simeon was a prophet, even though the only prophecies we ever hear him utter are these few words he says to Mary. Some scholars say that Anna, the old woman in the story, and Simeon, are the last of the Old Testament prophets. In this way, Luke is telling us that this event in the temple in Jerusalem ushers out the Old Testament and the law and ushers in the New Testament and grace. The Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that he would not see death before he had first seen God's Messiah. On this particular day, the Holy Spirit told Simeon to get himself down to the temple. He must have known something special was up the Holy Spirit doesn't tell you to do something without a reason. This timing had nothing to do with calculations from Old Testament prophecy, nothing to do with the recent loosing of Zechariah's tongue upon the birth of John the Baptist. Simeon surely would have known of that event. He may have even been among those present. No, it was direct guidance from the Holy Spirit. It was by the Spirit's nudging that Simeon went to the temple at the exact time that Joseph and Mary were bringing Jesus. While this was God's perfect timing, it also depended on the obedience of Simeon, Joseph, and Mary. Joseph and Mary were obediently doing what was required of them by the law. Simeon was listening to and obeying the Holy Spirit. From the way the story plays out, it almost seems as, Simeon, as if Simeon were laying and waiting for the new family. As soon as Jesus was brought into the temple, Simeon snatched him up into his arms. He didn't hesitate. He didn't ask if he could hold the baby. He didn't inquire of the parents about the circumstances of the child's birth. He didn't ask for any credentials or proof that this baby was indeed the Messiah. Through the Spirit, he had no doubt that this was the right child. He had been promised by the Spirit that he wouldn't die until he had seen the Messiah, and it was by that same Spirit that he was able to recognize Jesus. So without any hesitation, without introducing himself or asking permission, he took the child Jesus into his arms and began praising God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. He was saying, in effect, praise God, now I can die happy. God's promise to me has been fulfilled. I've seen the Messiah. Can you imagine what Mary and Joseph were thinking? What is this crazy old guy talking about? And what does he think he's doing grabbing our baby from Mary's arms? What if he drops him? Although after a couple of visits from angels and hearing the bizarre story the shepherds told them, it probably would take a lot to surprise them. Verse 33 says they were amazed by what Simeon was saying. Dumbfounded would probably be a better word. Simeon declared God's intent that salvation was for everyone, not just Israel. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The angel announced to the shepherds, I am bringing you great news of great joy for all the people. 
to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. In Isaiah 49, God says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. So from the very beginning, we can see that our faith is meant to be an inclusive faith, embracing all who come. God's grace is for all people who accept it through Jesus. Simeon held and beheld the baby in his arms. For one awesome moment, Simeon saw the world's salvation in the person of that infant. Then he was ready to leave that world, secure in the knowledge that God's promises are always, always fulfilled. Simeon had just a few moments on the world stage, but before he departs, he has some parting words. He tells Mary and Joseph that their son will be cause for the fall and rise of many. He has come to upset the status quo, to change the world order. As Mary sang earlier, he will bring down the powerful from their thrones and lift up the lowly. He will fill the hungry with good things and send the rich away empty. And he warns Mary that there will be great sadness in her future. A sword would pierce her soul. Last week, Kate completed a sermon series on the gifts of Advent. Hope, peace, waiting, joy, and love. Now I'd like to propose that Simeon was the whole Advent package. He had all those gifts. Hope. He hoped for the consolation of Israel. He hoped for the Messiah. He had hope in the knowledge that he would see the Messiah. He had hope in God's word, hope that God's promises to him and to Israel would be fulfilled. His hope is what kept him going, kept him watching and waiting. He knew that the Messiah would be the hope of all the world. Peace. Simeon had confidence that he would see the Messiah. Now that God's promise had been fulfilled, Simeon's life was fulfilled. He was ready to die in peace. He knew that God was calling him home now, and he was at peace with that. Simeon saw and received God's salvation. When we receive God's salvation, we also receive God's peace. Waiting. Simeon knew how to wait. He'd been waiting for this day all of his life. Of course, all of Israel was supposed to be waiting for the Messiah. But Simeon was waiting purposefully. He was righteous and devout, dedicating himself to waiting. For God's salvation. But Simeon didn't really know exactly what he was waiting for. He knew he was waiting for the Messiah, but he didn't know whether to be looking for a baby, another old man, a young man, or maybe even a woman. He didn't know when or where this Messiah would arrive. He didn't know the answer that his waiting depended on. But he was a righteous man, and he knew how to wait upon the Lord, to let God be in control to wait for God's timing. Joy. When he sees and holds the Christ child, Simeon is filled with joy and sings God's praises. After a lifetime of seeking the Messiah, imagine the joy that was with finally Simeon's at finally finding him. Imagine what great privilege and joy he must have felt knowing God's promise had been fulfilled and he was holding God's salvation in his arms. Love. Simeon knew the love of God. He felt the love of God when he held the child Jesus. He knew that God loved him and that God was ready to receive him into God's love. And from what he said to Mary, I believe Simeon loved all people. Simeon and Anna both proclaimed the salvation of God in Christ to others. And that's still our calling today, to proclaim God's salvation, to bring hope to the hopeless, to bring joy to the joyless, to bring peace where there is strife, to bring love where there is hatred, and to wait for the Lord. St. Francis of Assisi wrote many, many prayers, and I'd like to end with probably his most, most famous one. I think it pretty much sums up our call to live as Advent people. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, 
to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.